Ladies and gentlemen, AMD and Intel are currently battling it out on three separate fronts. The first is low power devices, for example, laptops and notebooks, those type of devices. The second are desktops. This could be anything from a KB Lake i3 or perhaps a Ryzen 7, all the way to the soon to be released Threadripper. And the final, probably the most profitable of all of these arenas, is of course the server platforms. These usage scenarios could be anything, cloud computing, scientific research, but regardless, there is one usage scenario which remains consistent. Folks who build these expect the CPUs to be processing an awful lot of data, and that's why you can enter a data center and certainly see a lot of legacy systems but also many of these data centers are hungry for more powerful devices which they can offer to customers or perhaps even use internally with all of that said my name's paul and in this regular gaming to the video we're going to be discussing amd's epic 7000 series because specifications and performance have leaked ahead of the processor's official unveiling or perhaps more accurately before the nda is lifted a website by the name of videocards.com have managed to get hold of some slides and performance data. Perhaps most intriguing of all of these specifications is the fact that all Ryzen 7000 proce processors will have access to 8 channels of DDR4 memory and 128 PCIe lanes. It's obvious if you were to take a look at AMD's previous conferences, for example the Investor Conference, that they imagine a future where data centers, in other words, companies which require an awful lot of computing power, not just invest in Epic, but also in Vega as well. Multiple Vega's GPUs actually for the same rank. Therefore, in such instances, bandwidth is obviously rather important, and having a low number of PCIe lanes doesn't benefit them. So, I won't read through the entire list of SKUs, because quite frankly, I'll be here for two long but there are epic one socket cpus and also multiple socket um, platforms as well i'm going to read out a couple because i feel these are perhaps illustrate the point rather well let's start out with the 7281 which is a 16 core 32 thread processor runs at 2.1 gigahertz base turbos up to 2.7 155 watts tdp slash 170 right remember those figures 7601 is a 32 core 64 thread CPU which has a base clock of 2.2, turbo clock of 3.2 with a TDP of 180. Now what I find rather interesting is the fact that one has only one figure for TDP while the other has two. Originally when I was reading this out from top to bottom I actually thought okay well um, you know that makes an awful lot of sense. But then obviously I started to notice the second figure. Uh, the individual who managed to get these leaked slides says that he's not sure why they actually have two values for certain processors. Whether it's something to do with the configuration, perhaps something to do with something entirely different, we just can't be certain. Now let's talk about pricing and performance. Obviously, these two factors are incredibly important, perhaps the most important when you're buying any hardware. Now, obviously, once again, there are far too many SKUs here for me to read out. But if we were to take a look at the Xeon One Socket, um, Epic One Socket configurations, you've got, for example, the Epic 7601, which has apparently 147% performance compared to the 100% performance, of course, of the E5. 2699A V4. Now that might sound incredibly impressive. Unfortunately, these figures from the Intel side of things are utilizing Broadwell E. They are not using the Skylake Xeon processors, which of course AMD will soon be competing against because Intel would be rolling them out, including the gold and platinums. These Pearly Lake CPUs do actually have a similar number of maximum threads slash cores, at least on the higher end SKUs, of course, compared to Nepal's, up to 32 cores, 64 threads. The differences lie in TDP. You have a lower TDP, only 160 watts compared to 180, but you have 
only 38.5 megabytes level 3 from what we can understand the pause has up to 64 and second and perhaps more damning of all is the fact that DDR4 support is limited to just six channels compared to eight. This means that you can put in an awful lot of memory, have an awful lot of memory bandwidth without too much issues at all. We have discussed AMD's Infinity Fabric before, and really this is the crux of the matter, allowing communication across multiple processor cores or multiple processors uh, on the same motherboard. It's probable that this is the reason that AMD are being so aggressive. They've mentioned a couple of times over the, their philosophy of building their products to be almost Lego-like. In other words, they can just add bits as they want. There's a couple of advantages to this. The first is that yields are better, and the other advantage is that you can tweak things as required. So, for example, if a client come to you and said, hey, I need this or this, well, then they can tweak that as required, and basically the turnaround is much faster. So, in which case, with Infinity Fabric, you not only have faster chip-to-chip -chip communication, but also it's incredibly scalable. Just as a quick recap as well, currently we're on Epic, which is using Ryzen, the original Zen architecture. It's built on 14nm. Over the next couple of years, AMD will also introduce Rome and Milan, which will be built, built upon Zen 2 and Zen 3, which will use 7nm and 7nm plus... R, um, 7 NM plus silicon uh, as appropriate. So, are Intel screwed? Well, honestly, I'm planning to do a rather lengthy video of AMD versus Intel in the next few days because I'm getting an awful lot of messages asking, do I think Intel's finished and all of this stuff? And I do have an awful lot to say on the subject, so I do want to put that out there. However, very briefly in this instance, there are a couple of things to remember. Firstly, when it comes to data centers and so on, reliability is incredibly important. Now, I'm not saying this will be the case, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's the case that some data centers just simply do not go with AMD, even if it is the better scenario. Let's assume it costs, let's be super, super silly here and say that it outperforms Intel by 20%. Let's just be super silly and say that it's 20% cheaper as well. So it just makes so much more sense to go with AMD they still may not go with AMD. And that's not because they're getting better deals. That's not because they're Intel fanboys or anything like that. It's for one reason only. It's reliability. Now, that's not to say that AMD's hardware is going to break. It's not, you know, expecting to burst into flames. It's just that they need to make sure there's a level of reliability that they can basically guarantee to customers. You know, many of these um, server farms if they're farming out VMs or whatever, will suggest that they have 99.99% uh, reliability. In other words, that they won't go down. And if they do, then you'll basically get a part of your uh, hosting package refunded per month. Basically, what I'm saying is that they'll probably want to wait until the CPUs are out in the wild and there's a lot more tests done. And basically, they know that they can... Be sure that there's not software issues with them or driver issues with them or that, you know, the BIOS doesn't go wrong or that the reliability of the silicon is good and all of this stuff. Now, that's not to say that all server farms are going to do this. Smaller server farms, smaller farms with budgets or those who require an awful lot of GPU performance, I do suspect will probably jump on this and welcome it with open arms. Intel, however, do a couple of have, excuse me, a couple of other aces up their sleeve, including X-Point technology and all of that stuff. And quite frankly, I don't think that there's going to be a winner here. I do feel, however, that AMD will definitely start to claw back some market share from AM, from Intel. Don't forget, this is not the first time that Intel and AMD have competed. With Back in the day, you had the Optron range of processors from AMD, and they did fairly well. Yes, Intel did traditionally have quite the larger market share, but that's not to say that that was the only offering. In fact, back in those days, as a very slight aside, I used to do a little bit of website development, but I also used to do a lot of maintenance and set stuff up for clients and other bits and bobs. In some instances, I actually did some virtual machine work. Um, and basically, in many instances, I was actually 
discussing um, with web hosts, you know, what they could offer my clients or what have you. And in those instances, you would quite often see the cheaper ones for clients that were on a more limited budget would have Optron. And in most cases, that was more than enough for like web servers and stuff like that. So that's just a slight aside. So anyway, um, I think that's just about it for this video. As I said, there will be an awful lot more coming up on the channel, um, which is good, I think. Uh, so thanks very much for all of the support and all of that stuff. Uh, we have a couple of reviews which are going to be finished. We have a couple of extra products which are going to be sent over the next couple of weeks. I can't go any, into details of those because unfortunately I'm under some NDAs. Um, and what was the other thing? Oh yes, and there's a couple of other videos, like I said, I want to do the Intel versus AMD thing, and some stuff on the GPU market as well, and possibly, just possibly, I might squeeze out an Xbox One X video regarding the graphical fidelity, because I've had a few people message me asking my opinions on that whole thing. So, take care of yourselves. Bye for now.